I think we have our link with uh, Tartu. I think that Andre Bielli can hear us, although you can't see him, but he will be here later on. So we're now moving on to our panel on EU-Russia. And we're very, very privileged to have with us um, a very distinguished expert from the Russian Federation, whose work some of my students have read, I know, from our courses, because we include a section on EU-Russian energy relations, and this is how I became familiar with Nikolai Koveshnikov's work. He's the head of the Department of European Integration Studies at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, which is in Moscow. And he's a leading research fellow at the Institute of Europe of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is one of the leading um, institutions in Moscow for the study of the EU. He also has held the John Monet Chair, and he has a background in political science. He's a very prolific author on energy relations between the EU and Russia. His knowledge has very deep knowledge of EU energy uh, policy. And in 2010, he published a book called Transformation of the Institutional Structure of the European Union, which he was kind enough to give me a copy of. I don't have it here, but it looks like a very interesting book. I haven't read it yet, but I look forward to it. And so he will be um, speaking, actually, I guess you're speaking second after. Um, we have Amelia going first, actually, Marcel. So we have to get the PowerPoint for Amelia up before we begin. But I'll just introduce everybody on the panel while they're sorting that out. Amelia Hatfield, you've already been introduced to, but I'll just say a few more words about her. As mentioned, she's a professor and holds a Jean Monnet chair. And I don't think I can pronounce the name of your university correctly. I would guess it's Vrija? Vreja. Vreja. University in Brussels. She is um, an expert on the EU foreign policy and public policy analysis and has a wide range of interests that deal with energy policy not only restricted to the EU-Russia area, but also more generally dealing with the, the European neighborhood, EU Arctic issues, even North Africa and the Middle East. So we'll start out with Amelia, who will give us a kind of EU perspective on the issue. Then we'll move to Nikolai, who will give a Russian perspective. And then we'll connect with Andrei Bieli, who's going to give us a perspective from the Baltic states. OK. Okay, thank you very much. So a proper good morning uh, to you and uh, a very, um, very deep um, thanks also to, to Joan for her uh, gracious invitation. Um, so I'd like to thank obviously the Center for uh, European Studies here at the University of Carleton. I was last uh, here at Carleton when I was I think about 14 and I came uh, as part of my, my middle school trip to, to our great nation's capital and we stayed here at Carleton and I have very fond memories. I, I don't think I thought at the time I'll be back uh, but certainly it's delightful to be back. I'd like to thank also the Canada-Europe um, Transatlantic Dialogue, um, the outputs of which are, are not just prolific but incredibly high quality um, and it's a real privilege to be associated um, with, the, uh, with that dialogue and also of course of course, um, the Jean Monnet chair, and the Jean Monnet chair, I think, is very much um, what, what you make of it. Um, you can you can uh, just produce a variety of outputs that um, that go nowhere, and of course, that's not the point. Um, or you can do something that's really interesting and cutting act, cutting edge, and, and interactive, involves a lot lot of people, and that's exactly what Joan's done. So she's to be commended um, for her far sighted understanding of exactly what a chair, um, a Jean Monnet chair, uh, can do. I hope that what I've been doing in Brussels is at least even halfway <laughs> halfway decent. So yes, as you said, I'm from the the Vrij University at Brussels, uh, which is the Flemish national university. It's on, as I was saying last night, at the same stretch of land um, as the French university with who we don't speak. And that's it. OK, as we are divided in terms of our linguistic apartheid, much like Canada. But um, at least Canada has a, a better sense of how to get over it. So 20 minutes. Unbelievable. Workshop goals, therefore. Um, I can skip through these. I just put these on almost uh, as, as, as a remembrance uh, for me. But certainly what I'd like to um, talk about in, in reference to EU-Russia um, is to get a better understanding um, of the impact of the European Union's own energy policies um, as it, as it um, deals with, with Russia. I think um, in, in terms of our talks with, with Canada today, it's, it's been very, very helpful. This is the objective, actually, that, that Joan wrote into um, the, the brief that, that we used to put together the, 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 the workshop. Um, and certainly the idea that we have a complex mix of objectives and considerations 
considerations is, I, I think, uh, not, not, not just accurate, but something of an understatement. And I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to unpick uh, some of these complexities, um, certainly. So we've done panel one. I put the Arctic up there, um, hoping that perhaps somebody would raise it. So maybe we can talk about it a little bit later. There we go. Now, I'm going to move on to the European Union. I mentioned this morning um, the, the polyvalent nature um, of energy security within the European Union, and I think that's uh, it's, it's a wide-ranging but also a peculiarly appropriate term um, to describe what the European Union um, is. And of course, again, it has a split personality problem because it's a variety um, of multi-level uh, actors um, acting on the widest policy area, I think, um, that, that, that we've seen with a huge number of political, social, and economic implications. You have, of course, uh, the Commission, um, um, which at this point, under Lisbon now has a variety of, of, of stronger competences uh, to make impact um, on energy security and related policies like competition, like the internal market, like trade, and uh, most substantively of all, like climate change. However, they are very much rivaled even now, and we should not take for granted the robust sovereign strength that the member states in the European Union, all of them have, with regards to retaining their own competence. Do not um, misunderstand. The, 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 the member states have not in any way reneged or attenuated their ability uh, to have the competence um, in a variety of areas on energy security, chiefly putting together their own energy mix um, and negotiating with foreign suppliers. They continue to hold that, and while they do, energy security will be deeply divided um, with regards to the mix, and the buying, the procuring, and the using of that mix, and every other form of, of impact that that mix will have um, a variety across the European Union. You also have national energy companies, of course, um, and a variety of private energy companies. And national energy companies is, is any energy company with more than a 50% a stake being, being, being held by the, the government. We've heard, heard quite a lot this morning, which is good. It means I don't have to kind of uh, give you too much of the profile of the European Union. But it is, of course, an enormously integrated uh, trading bloc um, and it, it's increasingly having block-to-block -block relations as part of its foreign policy mantra, not just um, um, uh, sort of union bilateral relations as well. And I think per perhaps the future um, of energy security actually might be block-to-block -block relations, kind of NAFTA-EU relations or EU-Mercosur relations or EU-ASEAN relations. I think we have to keep that category open. Uh, certainly with regards to the, the, the development, not just of, of, of energy security, uh, but the increasingly global nature of the connections um, between these. They're clearly drilling for oil as I speak. So um, operating on the basis of, of, of rolling treaties. Rolling treaties is a polite way of saying that the sort of <laughs> uh, generational attempt uh, the European Union feels compelled uh, to abide by, to, to, to revisit and revisit even in the face of various national no's. Um, the European Union, of course, is a large uh, energy consumer. But uh, it's cursed by geography. It has very little uh, indigenous energy resources. Um, so even if it's uh, shale in, in Poland that we're, we're looking at tapping, you're still not looking anywhere near at what the European Union, frankly, is going to need come 28 member states uh, next month uh, to be able to decently supply uh, its population and its industrial growth. So the question, I think, for those of us who look at energy, who look at the European Union, who look at its foreign policy, is to figure out what it is. Is it a foreign policy actor? Is it an energy actor? Can it make its own policy? Is it um, a sort of conscious player um, in that sense? Well, yes and also no. Clearly, it has uh, a variety of energy policies and um, it has climate change policies. And we saw the fairly, sort, you know, plus minus uh, given to it uh, this morning. Um, uh, and at the same time, I think we've, we've also seen some holes in that. So it has a three-part energy policy. Um, the union uh, abides by its love of uh, architecture that specializes in three pillars. Um, so having knocked apart Maastricht, it continues to have the three pillars of competitiveness, security of supply, and sustainability. And of course, it has its own legal uh, framework, the Aki, the beloved Aki, um, connected to a variety of, of policies, including competition and trade, and also the internal market. I think this gives us the, the sort of legal substructure, if you like, underneath which um, European Union uh, energy security I is built and protected in, in some sense. But at the same time, as I've just mentioned, with a sovereign imperative continuing to rest in the member states, they continue to have, if you like, the impetus, the will, and the rationale uh, to determine their own uh, imports, the reason for their own imports, the destination of their exports, and the type of the energy mix. And of course, that, that does make for a fairly variegated policy uh, network, if you like. Um, I, I am going to have these um, 
uh, made available, obviously. So for those of you who are interested in some of the more detailed uh, nature, if you like, of the European Union energy policy, and you should, of course, um, please feel free to, to um, go over these forensically. Um, this does mean I get a little bit more time and I can, I can shift past them very, very quickly. But here you go again, the, the three legs. Uh, most interesting, of course, for, for Russia um, would be the connections with security of supply. I mean, that is the sort of innate foreign policy component in, in, within these three legs. Um, you're talking, of course, the, the dirty D word of, of diversification, um, but a variety of other options as well, including European Union-owned pipelines um, and LNG terminals, which I'll come to um, in, in a while. Um, let's just take a step back. I think before we're talking about energy, what you are actually talking about is, is, is a market, which is a long-standing economic and now political ambition of the very founders um, of Europe. And we were right um, to hear this morning that energy has been uh, at the heart, if you like, of the founding mandate of the community and now the union in terms of coal and steel, as I think it was uh, Schumann himself said, you know, binding together the sinews um, um, of peace in order that war do does not break out. And the, the primary philosophy, of, of course, is open competition, um, disaggregating anything um, that smacks um, of a monopoly, um, and in energy terms, making sure that you don't get an abundance of, of too many um, suppliers in one particular region. There shouldn't be a dominance in, across the EU um, distribution networks. Um, so the EU Commission, I think, has, has two main goals. Of course, they're trying to complete, which is not even finished now, the single market. But on top of that, they're trying to complete the single energy market. And they're doing this by a variety of gas directives and electricity directives, which are now all bundled together in what we call the third package, in which I will mention uh, in a minute. So here you have directives all of which have to be successively adopted by all 27 and soon 28 member states and completed, and this is a pretty ambitious goal, uh, by 2014. So the centerpiece is the third energy package. And what it does is it brings together a variety of directives which either are long-standing or have not been implemented or have been implemented incorrectly um, and tries to, I think, in some sense, press the reset button um, and, and try again with the European Commission basically waving their finger at the member states to say, this time we mean it this time it has to be done, because it's not just the um, energy market that's going to suffer as, as a result, given the austerity measures, it's all of the market in the European Union. You're looking um, at seriously um, um, undermining Europe's productivity, industrial um, cap capacity, competition, and trade. So the, you know, the, the stakes really, in a sense, I think could, could not be higher. And they're pinning the entire point um, of the third legislative package on the concept of unbundling. So they're taking a, a, a firm aim at the concept of monopolies and the need to disaggregate them, to pick them apart vertically um, and to uncouple, if you like, upstream and downstream. And not just to, I think, do this for the sake um, of, of market principles, but to make sure that the European own, the European's own energy house is in order. I need to say this because there's been a great deal, I think, um, of uh, misinformation with regards to this. And I'm, I'm saying this with, with, with great respect to, to my Russian colleague, because quite naturally, Russia thinks this is, this is aimed at them. And he'd be right, because it is clearly aimed at Russia. It's also aimed at the European Union. They have to put their house in order. And I'm talking here about the, the major national champions who have been incredibly reluctant to pick up and take on and absorb the legislative and the infrastructural need um, to tackle their own national monopolies. And until they do that, quite rightly, Gazprom is going to say, well, this particular terrain, there's no sense of level playing field. Why on earth should we cooperate when you're, you're not, you don't have your own sort of you know, indigenous buy-in, if I could put it? The interesting thing is it puts the European Union in the position of being a good cop uh, and a bad cop. The commission, of course, continues to be a regulatory watchdog. Oh, being Michael Jackson. Um, um, phasing out a variety of regulated prices. This is what it does all the time. It does it very well. Um, and analyzing the, the, the good and bad use, if you like, um, of subsidies. Um, member states have uh, particular aspects and, and perspectives with regards to, to, to subsidies. Some have gone far too far, uh, and others treat them a little more judiciously. The point, of course, is to protect the customer, to protect the citizen, to protect the vulnerable, in any sense, in the European Union. But they're increasingly perceived, um, in, in some sense, as a bit of a bad cop um, with the European Commission um, acting from a top-down scrutiny-based perspective over the third energy package um, and threatening to some degree uh, a variety of public and private actors uh, with infringement proceedings or dragging them to the European Court of Justice and implementing heavy fines if they don't um, abide by the suggestions. So the third energy package is incredibly topical. It's very, very contentious. Um, there's no way it's going to be implemented by 2014, and I'll stake what's left of my, my career on that. Um, 
it has caused outright anger uh, in, in, in many quarters of Europe and in Russia as well, and particularly amongst Gazprom as well. And I think the, the generally quite sedate um, uh, sort of rhetoric that you hear from the Commission has been increasingly sharpened of late. And there's a wonderful uh, quote by uh, Mr. Oettinger himself, the European Energy Commissioner, Russia must, must abide by the EU's internal market rules Good luck, and stop offering widely varying prices. That, that's one of the, that, that's an absolute uh, shot over the bows of, of Gazprom. Um, this was immediately followed by a public announcement of an investigation into suspected uh, anti-competitive market practices by amongst others. I must put this Gazprom as well. Um, so where, where would we find energy? Where would you go to find energy in EU foreign policy? Where, where do we see it um, sitting um, as well as uh, Russia? Obviously, the EU-Russia energy dialogue um, has been in existence for more than a decade. Now, whether it's a talking shop um, or whether it's a quiet um, a crucible, if you like, for some, for some decent policy development remains, I think, to be seen. But if I'm saying this, it remains to be seen a decade afterwards. I think you get the picture. Um, the neighborhood policy, by and large, is a tremendous vehicle. Uh, for European energy security aims um, in the variety of bilaterally agreed action plans with 16 plus states. Um, there's a series of energy provisions and energy understandings built into each one of these. So there's a nice series of profiles that the EU has with its neighbors, its, its neighbors across North Africa, uh, the Middle East, uh, and Eastern, um, Eastern Europe as well. But as you can imagine, of these 16 states, um, many, many of them are very volatile. They're currently going through a tremendous period of revolution and restoration and reformation. Um, and energy is high on the list for some of them, but for example, for others, it's, it's just simple you know, peace breaking out as well. Um, the Energy Community Treaty, um, a surprising, unlooked for success amongst the Balkan states, the one area of Europe that has been war-torn and ravaged for decades, managed to get it together on one of the toughest policies um, in existence, energy, and put together, and this would, I think, answer the question raised by our Indian colleague before, um, uh, with regards to interconnectors, uh, interregional development, um, and in fact has been so successful that the EU is going to probably um, I think fuse it, I think, if you like, as, a, as, a, as an energy-focused aspect of the, of the acquis, uh, and rolling it out to other non-European member states like Ukraine. So the question remains with regards to stretching out legislative norms and values and, and, and provisions, could it be extended or some part of it to Russia? Could that be incorporated into the current post-CA, post-PCA agreements that we're beginning to see? Possibly. It's a very successful um, um, legal structure in its own right, but it's going to come smack up against the Energy Charter Treaty, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you see also energy uh, at, at work in a variety of other partnerships in sub-Saharan Africa and also Central Asia as well. I'd like to return for a minute to the new role played uh, by the Commission. When news broke of this uh, in, in September 2011, it really was uh, quite, quite a shock. This is the Commission arming itself, I think, and giving itself, endowing itself uh, with powers uh, to negotiate uh, and to, to not just to legislate, but to, to negotiate as well, suggesting that the Commission um, not sit in the background, but put itself um, at the high table with regards to negotiating with other um, gas and oil um, exporters in, into the European Union. And not just doing that, in fact, setting itself as something of a legal watchdog providing, as it says, an opinion on the conformity of energy contracts, agreements, with EU law and much more obliquely and much more challengingly, I think, the EU security of supply objectives, which can be interpreted in a various number of ways. So if the Council permits, um, and they're certainly getting ready to, to, the Commission could certainly be this new actor. It could negotiate a variety of key energy agreements. Um, at the EU level, not quite supranationally, because it doesn't have the competence to do so, but council mandated. So intergovernmental mandate use of the commission as a supranational actor to tackle that very uneasy balance of energy security itself torn between intergovernmental and supranational components. So it's, it's a cheeky bit of kind of post-treaty um, um, decision making, if you like. Um, this is just the sort of thing that would have wound up Margaret Thatcher. Okay. I was just about to say, God rest her soul, but then I changed my mind. An enormous step forward. Is it an enormous step forward? It is, actually. It's the first time we've seen the Commission moving forward clearly with a focused idea of what it can do in terms of representing the European Union, and dare I say it, speaking with one voice. It could potentially do this. Um, it could, in a sense, as well, sharpen the idea of what energy security is and what it represents, and it may... Um, particularly with regards to its relationship with Russia, provide the European Union with an enhanced, at least diplomatic capacity, if you like, to, to deal with its own energy security with third-party suppliers, and not just a series of market mechanisms, which certainly aren't, uh, aren't getting grounded enough. Um, 
Before the bad news, let's talk a little bit about the good news. Of course, there's a variety of very decent and ongoing um, and sometimes unregarded uh, e economic ties between the European Union and Russia. I think Kyohane and Nye would use this as an uh, example of neat, complex interdependence. Mr. Nye himself uh, interviewed on uh, Canadian TV a little while ago and talking about the, the ongoing need uh, for, for complex interdependence to, to moderate and modify um, international diplomatic elements, especially um, with the European Union and Russia. Um, they're, they're each an enormously important trade and investment partner for the, for the other. Um, there's, it's, it's virtually impossible to, to, to see areas where you could legitimately unpick them in, in, in an easy way, it would be it would be absolute catastrophe. I think um, we've seen imports rise and we've seen imports fall, but uh, generally, and the percentages can can change. What we continue to see is Russia's natural gas export absolutely dominant with regards to the European Union in terms of that and gas and crude oil. You can look at these later on, and the perennial Russian amb amb ambition remaining to be the EU's main source of of gas and oil. That should come as no surprise. Even when I say it now, you still get a sucking of teeth around the, the room. <sighs> I can't believe she said that. Well, of course it is. This is, this is going to be the continued geopolitical and technical um, ambition of, of, of the Russian state. They also want to be far more than that, though. They want to continue to be a main export route, quite naturally, for energy producers a along the Central Asian belt, if you like, and also um, penetrating deeper into northern and central Europe. They've already done so with a variety of uh, pipeline, kind of pincer-like uh, sort of movements, if you like. And as we heard before this morning, with regards to Eastern diversification, the idea of tapping into the Asian markets, something Canada should be thinking a little more sharply about, clearly uh, a major ambition to be a prime supplier. We've also seen Russia at work in, in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as a new investor, um, but uh, again, like China, with a clear view to, to promoting um, the exploitation um, of fossil fuels down there. I think the point is that the, the Russian um, uh, um, people and the Russian government um, view themselves not necessarily uh, as anything other than a, a strategic partner. And Europe's um, flaw, if you like, has been to sort of treat it um, accidentally as something of a political customer. And that's, that's certainly produced a variety of, of, of problems between the two. I'm going to give you one or two um, quotes because it's a kind of a fun thing to do. This is the European Commission's suggestion as to what ideal relations between um, the two actors might might look like. Um, I think this is put together by Oettinger's staff, but nobody, when I called them, would, would, would um, take responsibility for it. The overall objective of the energy partnership is to enhance the energy security of the European continent by binding Russia and the EU into a closer relationship in which all issues of mutual concern in the energy sector can be addressed. So all issues on the principle of binding. At the same time, ensuring that the policies of opening, whose policies are these, and integrating energy markets are pursued. With the strong mutual dependency, oh, well, that's interesting. You hear of interdependence on Locke, but mutual dependency. It makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up if you understand what it po might possibly truly mean. We're both going down. And common interest in the energy sector. This is clearly a key area of EU-Russian relations. It is clearly a key area of Russian relations, but there's not another word up there that's going to stick, at least not in Moscow. It's legally lackluster. We've seen a variety of tried and failed attempts between Russia and the European Union time after time. Um, and I think the most uh, notorious, although it's not always the most famous, is the, the Energy Charter Treaty. I know Andre is going to have uh, quite, a, quite a bit to say on that. He and I regularly spar at uh, conferences like this. There's much um, conceptual blood spilt over this with regards uh, to, to Russia provisionally signing the Energy Charter Treaty uh, and then uh, bailing out on it uh, as a result of its pr the prosecution of the, 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 the UCOS uh, case. Partnership and Cooperation Agreement. Um, stalled again. Uh, we need to try to uh, resurrect this. We need to try to find a, a new legal basis in which there are concrete energy provisions built in on something post-PCA, something post- uh, partnership and cooperation. Variety, I think, of good initiatives, but they haven't completely uh, stuck yet. The common spaces, the single package of roadmaps, then the problem with the Russian withdrawal uh, from the Energy Charter Treaty, kind of you know, pouring cold water all, all, all of this. I think the partnership for the modernization may be at this point, because it's not too overarching, it's not too sort of blueprinty, um, might be the best uh, way forward. Um, at the same time, you then get these sorts of responses from the Russian foreign minister. If the European Union continues to push, and this is in reference to the third package, continues to threaten Gazprom with unbundling directives, continues to insult the sovereign interests of Russia, insists on backward economic structures and unenforceable 
legal attitudes. I take this as to be an energy charter treaty related. Or undermines bilateral trade relations with the European partner states, not just the union, but the member states. Gazprom can easily find ways to ensure that energy diversification takes on a swift and permanent Eastern dimension. I feel like I'm playing chess when I read this. It's just um, problematic. So where does this leave us? It means that at this point, if I can quote um, a, a Russian colleague of mine, Tatiana Romanova, energy is the least well-focused, least legally detailed area of Russia-EU cooperation. And that means it's rife not only for politicization, uh, but securitization as well. Um, and the problem, of course, is that both sides have, have two different views, and here they are. The European Union's security of supply perspective in the European Union's security of demand perspective. And I'm astonished in the panel this morning that nobody actually clearly said that energy security is a Janus-faced concept. And it depends, as Kissinger said, you stand depending on where you sit, or vice versa. Open energy markets versus state-managed markets and all the rest of them. Demand-side reduction, cheap gas outweighing European in, uh, in energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. You've got, I, I, I don't want to kind of overstretch the idea that they're polar opposites, but there's so much at odds, at variance, that needs to be overcome, at least in language terms at this point, that even sector-specific, very basic sector-specific agreements between the two sides don't hold out much um, promise um, at this point. And the outcome is the following, politicized energy security, a sort of identity-based us versus them, uh, polar split uh, between the two, between importer states uh, and exporter states. And this is a nice conceptualization. It was one that Joan Rinch mentioned this morning in terms of how we can classify um, our energy actors. This is, uh, it's, it's an oldie, but it's still a very, very goodie. And what it, what it misses, I think, is a redefinition, uh, not just of the kinds of states that we have in terms of energy identities, but the kind of energy security methods, modes, definitions, and interpretations um, that we haven't yet seen before, except maybe with global governance. That's, that's the only way. So I'm going to move on just a little bit to show you my lovely gas pipelines. Gas pipelines, the Druzhba uh, pipeline connection. I think what each one of you show, uh, what each one show you is a, a, a strong, sustained, east-west um, connection uh, between, from one to the other. So the, a variety of Russian pipelines include the Northern Lights, the Soyuz, and the Brotherhood. These are the ones that were shot off in the 06 and 09 gas bats, um, and a variety of ones um, transiting Poland. And anti-transit options, of course, mean either uh, building around them um, or, or finding new partners um, and new routes. Here's Mr. Putin's take on it um, as of um, just a few months ago. We consider it our common objective, common Russian objective, to upgrade, absolutely, and diversify. Oh dear, our energy infrastructure. You know that we have completed the Nord Stream, Baltic, South Stream, all the rest of it. So a bit of a shopping list, if you like, for where the pipelines are and who, who needs them. They will significantly increase energy security to Europe. Well, good, that's great. That's the kind of, I think, uh, talk that goes down very well uh, in the European Commission, that the, 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 these variety you know, of infrastructure projects, of course, are for the benefit of the European Union. But when you get comments a few months before from Mr. Lavrov, suggesting you know, that Russia is not prepared to pull its punches. It's, 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 it's difficult, is it? We can sell it. So here are the pipelines. You can look at these with a coffee on a Saturday when you have nothing else to do, Blue Stream. Final point, what can the European Union do? Does it have its own sort of um, energy arsenal? Well, it has, in a sense, a variety of tap points which it hasn't made a whole lot of use of, um, chiefly uh, the Caspian, and I'm thinking here of the port of Baku in Azerbaijan, which is a very firm European neighborhood state now within the European Union. Variety of other shareholders um, tapping on to the famous trans-Adriatic pipeline, Nabucco. I just always put, not just an Italian opera, oh yes it is. Um, the construction here between the two, uh, on again, off again, but perhaps closer this year than any others. Um, I have one on shale and we can talk about it a little bit later. Um, I think the point is um, that even if there are superabundant potential, as I mentioned this morning, the switch is not going to be overnight. The potential has not yet been, I think, empirically validated, and the pipeline infrastructure at this point um, is still pretty um, adolescent. So that's the last slide there. I think we need to redefine energy security itself before we point fingers at the European Commission for being overly hard with regards to their scrutiny and point fingers um, at Russia with being sort of um, overly um, affectionate with regards to their monopolies. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Did you want to put up uh, the next PowerPoint? I'm not sure where you got it there.
Nikolai Kovashnikov was next. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want I want to uh, thank uh, Carlton University and especially Jean Manet and personally John de Bartleben uh, for the invitation uh, and for uh, the opportunity to speak uh, here in such a well reputed uh, auditorium. It's my first visit uh, to Canada and my first uh, transatlantic flight. That's why I'm a bit sleepy, but I hope I will not fall asleep uh, in 20 minutes. <laughs> Mm. Okay, EU Russia relations, uh, uh, energy relations between the European Union and Russia. Uh, a kind of uh, Russian view, a kind of uh, further perspective from Russian side uh, of the table. Mm. Uh, I will uh, mostly uh, concentrate on uh, Russian energy policy and uh, on the third point on EU Russia relations because thanks to uh, Amelia, uh, she uh, gave a very uh, detailed uh, overview of European Union energy policy, uh, and I 95% uh, agree with uh, ideas she expressed about recent development of European energy policy. So, uh, you do a part of my job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Everybody knows that uh, Russia is uh, uh, quite a lot uh, reliable of, on energy sector. Uh, that's the truth uh, because uh, energy represents 30% uh, of GDP, uh, uh, more than half of export, uh, uh, and uh, as far as I remember, 70% of export into the European Union. And uh, energy revenues provide about half of Russian budget if we put together uh, official budget and some development funds, uh, development fi financial funds which uh, exist in Russia. Uh, in 2009, uh, Russian government adopted a new energy strategy till 2030. Uh, with several old priorities and uh, some uh, quite new and unusual for Russia priorities. Well, uh, old priorities is development of eastern regions uh, and uh, diversification of energy transport uh, infrastructure and, and gas and electricity. Uh, also, uh, quite an old uh, priority is development of Arctic Shelf. Uh, we've uh, heard about Stockman for many, many years, uh, at least for 15 years. And uh, now at least we know that uh, a week ago the decision was, was taken that uh, the development of Stockman uh, should be stopped because no demand in Europe. So let's wait another 15 years, but this is a long-term priority. Uh, and not uh, an everyday business. And two new priorities, uh, which are development of non-fuel energy, uh, um, renewable energy sources, uh, which uh, are uh, of quite modest use in Russia. Uh, now some uh, achievements, some measures uh, were adopted to stimulate renewable energy sources. Uh, well, um, something would, should be done and sh something will be done, but uh, I really do not expect that a renewable will take uh, the same place in Russian energy mix as in European Union or somewhere else, for example. Uh, and energy saving. Energy saving is a very crucial uh, aspect of Russian energy policy because uh, the most... Uh, uh, the most huge deposit of energy in Russia is not in Siberia, is in European part of country where 80% of consumption lies. If uh, uh, Russian economy will consume, uh, will increase uh, energy efficiency, uh, there would be uh, another source, another additional source of uh, fuel, electricity, energy, etc., etc. Of course, all these uh, plans require huge investments. Uh, here you can see a very detailed uh, information. Uh, the total volume is uh, huge. It's about uh, uh, 
2.5 uh, thousand billion of US de, uh, of uh, United States dollars till 2030. Uh, the, ma uh, the main conclusion which I can do is that uh, to invest such a huge money, uh, we need uh, foreign investments because uh, internal Russian energy companies has no and will not have such money. Uh, some slides about energy efficiency. Uh, you can see that uh, energy, uh, energy efficiency uh, has been increasing since uh, 2000. This is a natural process. This is a business adaptation for uh, uh, increased price of energy sources. Uh, here you can see more detail that uh, the above line uh, was a forecast of Russian energy f intensity, and uh, the this one line uh, is an actual trend of energy intensity. You see that uh, actually energy uh, intensity is uh, decreasing even faster than it was predicted. So uh, energy efficiency policy uh, is at the very beginning, but it will, uh, I, uh, I'm 90% sure that it will produce a very useful and very uh, adequate outcome. As far as concern, uh, external priorities of Russian energy uh, strategy, uh, we can identify uh, several crucial key uh, strategic elements. First of all, priority of European market. Uh, Russian uh, share in EU gas import is about 30%, uh, uh, coal 27%, oil 32-33%. Uh, uh, this is a Russian. Uh, this is the biggest. Uh, Europe is the biggest market of Russian energy resources. So. It is big consumer, it is predictable consumer, not as uh, China or probably not as Ukraine with uh, some uh, governmental troubles and shifts in policy, not as um, Belarus with very uh, personal, uh, personalized political regime. Uh, uh, Europe is predictable and lawful consumer. Uh, and. Last but not least, Europe pays adequate price for energy sources. Uh, for example, China uh, is not ready to pay uh, the same prices for gas and for oil as Europe pays. Our Russian strategic interests at, at the European market are the following. Uh, at least keep the market share, uh, maximize profit, uh, through access to the final consumer, because later on I will show you in details, final consumer pays for gas uh, three, four times more than uh, the revenue, uh, than the price of Gazprom. I will show you later. And of course, uh, to maintain existing rules of the game, which are uh, seriously undermined by European Union uh, legislation and by some uh, regulatory practices. Uh, of course, uh, uh, accent on European market uh, should be uh, should be, should be uh, made uh, with a line of some expert uh, diversification. But uh, expert on the East uh, will not be uh, so big as European expert. expert. You may see that uh, in 2005, uh, all Eastern uh, dimension of Russian exports for oil uh, was about uh, uh, 7%. It would be about 20% uh, in 2030. As far as concerned gas, uh, East export was zero in 2005. Probably it would be about 18-20% uh, in 2030. 
uh, Europe, uh, which is the green part of the column, will be major consumer, will stay as a major consumer. Well, this is simply an example of uh, uh, oil pi oil pipeline built several years ago to China and to Pacific region via Skovorodino and via Nahotka, where uh, from which uh, oil was transported to China and to some uh, uh, to Japan and to some other countries of Pacific. Another uh, key priority of Russian external energy policy is a stable uh, transit, uh, because uh, Russia, as well as European consumers, have suffered uh, f because of uh, unpredictable behavior of several transit countries. Uh, and uh, the main strategy chosen uh, is to uh, build a bypass pipeline via uh, Baltic Sea, Nord Stream, and via uh, Black Sea, South Stream. I should underline that which, these pipelines are not Russian pipelines. These are joint pipelines. You may see, for example, South Stream, Gazprom, 30%, Eni, 20%, Ventershell, EDF, etc., etc. The same picture is about uh, Nord Stream. There's a joint project of Russian and European business. And by the way, Nord Stream was included in the list of European Union priority infrastructure projects in 2001, and in 2006 it was repeated. Uh, uh, another priority is to preserve a uh, leading uh, role in energy of Central Asia, because Central Asia, especially Turkmenistan, uh, is a um, big uh, provider uh, of gas resources, which are um, quite useful for Russian internal market to substitute some uh, flows from Siberia. And of course, there is a, a very uh, clear commercial interest not to let Turkmenistan gas uh, on the European market, uh, you know, simply not to uh, not to meet another competitor at the European market. But by the way, uh, I should say that uh, this was not Russia who stopped uh, direct supply of Turkmen gas to Europe. Uh, the main uh, reason why such a supply does not take place is a, a Trans-Caspian pipeline via, via Caspian Sea from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan. The reason is that uh, this pipeline is very expensive and no European energy companies wants to pay the price. And of course Turkmenistan also don't want to pay the price of the pipeline. Turkmenistan has two consumers of gas, Russia and China. Uh, he, can, he can live without access to European market, especially after uh, Gazprom changed price setting policy on Turkmen gas in 2008-2009. And now to Turkmen, uh, uh, Turkmenistan re receives adequate price from gas flow to Russia. Mm. And latest priority of Russian external energy policy is uh, an attempt to di diversify energy export nomenclature. To export not raw materials, but uh, uh, some goods with added value. For example, not gas, but electricity, uh, not oil, but oil products, uh, or probably some sophisticated uh, services as uh, construction of nuclear plants, etc., etc. But I should uh, specify which such uh, uh, any attempts to diversify to diversify expert nomenclature. Uh, meet uh, very uh, 
very unwelcome uh, reaction from European side. For example, ideas to uh, export Russian electricity at European market have been discussed for 15 years and no results in, till now because of political decision of uh, Europe we don't need Russian electricity, we will buy Russian gas and we will produce electricity at our own uh, generation plants. Well, it's a rare decision, of course, but uh, we don't like it. <laughs> uh, I will not uh, speak in details about uh, European Union energy policy. The only thing uh, I want to discuss is uh, the balance between uh, liberalization and energy security. Uh, well, market liberalization was, uh, is, and will be the mainstream of European Union uh, energy policy. I mean, gas and electricity market liberalization. But nevertheless, we could uh, find some shifts uh, in European policy. Uh, more or less, uh, concerns of energy security uh, Mm. more or less European legislation uh, provide more balanced approach, uh, more uh, adequate balance between liberalization value and value of energy security. For example, uh, last uh, uh, directives, uh, third energy package uh, 2009, they provide uh, completely non-market measure 10 years infrastructure plans which should be uh, adopted by state regulators uh, so uh, European market is not a market European market is a kind of socialism uh, at least wow uh, in, in the Soviet Union there was a five years plan in Europe 10 years plan on, on energy infrastructure obligatory to fulfill by commercial actors, I underline. This is not simply non-binding planning. Uh, also, uh, a set of documents on gas security of supply regulation, uh, some documents on cross-border regulation, etc., etc., and also some uh, case law of European Court of Justice, for example, a campus oil case, which clearly states that the reason of energy security can be a legal ground for exceptions from uh, values of liberalization and uh, free market and free movement of uh, energy. But this work only then European legislation tried to balance interest of European producers and European consumers and provide energy security inside European Union. Uh, European legislation doesn't take into account uh, the interest of external actors, uh, despite the fact that 70% uh, of gas and 80% of oil, which European Union consumes, uh, is imported oil and imported gas. EU-Russia relations, abundance of controversial rules. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of agreements, uh, energy t chapter treaty, partnership and cooperation and agreement, road maps, etc., etc. Uh, a lot of agreements um, which do not cover energy sector as much as they should. From one side. From another side, no special binding agreements on energy. And by the way, uh, I want to uh, underline the several points which uh, does not, uh, which were not listed in Amelia presentation, because Amelia has the same slide about uh, legal base of Eurasia cooperation and energy. But uh, I was not surprised that Amelia didn't mention bilateral treaties of member states, for example, investment protection treaties, which uh, 
are in clear uh, contradiction with provisions of third energy package. So, or better to say, third energy package is in clear contradiction with bilateral obli obligations of member states under bilateral investment treaties with Russia. And uh, two other documents, uh, I should mention two Russian initiatives. This is a, a proposal on a Convention of International Energy Security and a proposal on agreement of cross-border energy infrastructure, which really fall in the darkness because nobody in Brussels wants to discuss it. Brussels has a key communautaire and don't want uh, to step aside of a key. Mm. But uh, we need not a unilateral set of rules, a uh, contradicting set of rules. We need one uh, mutually agreed set of rules which would accumulate all interests of both parties and uh, all concerns. Okay, third energy package. Uh, uh, this is a good document. I, I support ideas of uh, liberalization of European market. I uh, only want to uh, point uh, some consequences of third energy package to uh, Russian interests and to interests of Russian commercial companies. Retroactive application, uh, application of the law. Gazprom has pipeline in uh, Lithuania, but under third energy package, Lithuania, Lithuanian government uh, tried to nationalize this pipeline. Not, uh, not very market approach. Contradiction with existing obligations. Uh, and I should underline that this is not Russian view. This is the view supported by the European Court of Justice, who in the case European Commission versus Republic of Slovakia 2011, uh, clearly stand, uh, states that uh, bilateral investment treaties, in this case between uh, Slovakia and Switzerland, bilateral investment treaties has privilege over the unbundling provisions of the third energy package. Uh, well, uh, and some other uh, regulatory challenges. Uh, well, uh, well uh, may I take five more? Five more? <laughs> Well, uh, just uh, to point you some uh, mm, all the strange, the, the strange picture, uh, the, uh, the strange, uh, very strange picture. Uh, let's, for example, take uh, Nord Stream uh, pipeline uh, in the Baltic Sea. This is, uh, this is a pipeline built not in the territory of the, of the European Union. This is not under the uh, third energy package provision. But then uh, Nord Stream came at Greifswald. This is a city in Germany. We need to link this pipeline with a German gas transport system network. So two other pipelines were built, Nell and Opal. These pipelines are situated on European Union territory. They are under the rule of uh, third energy package, uh, in particular under the rule of uh, third party access provisions. Uh, what is the third party access provision? It say uh, pipeline should, should be open for anyone who wants to use it. So nobody can reserve the full pipeline, at least uh, under the long-term contracts, uh, supply can reserve 40, maybe 50% of pipeline capacity. Good rule, of course, it's good. It's competition, very well. And under these rules, we have a reality. Uh, European Commission uh, decided that Gazprom can reserve only 50% of NL and Opal capacity. Because other 50% should be uh, allowable, uh, uh, should be, uh, ac as, mm, should be uh, available. available, thank you, so should be available for anyone. But there is no any other supplier in Greifswald. From where somebody could take gas in Greifswald if this is not gas from Nord Stream, from nowhere. 
and now both these pipelines are used only at 50% capacity. Gazprom lose money, consumers lose gas, uh, especially during winter peak, peak period. So uh, who wins? Uh, market, uh, liberal market ideology of Brussels. Uh, fiat justitia e periat mundus. Should I translate or everybody understand? Uh, let uh, the world would crash, but uh, law would uh, uh, survive. Who won't be a victim of such an approach? Uh, Gazprom don't want. Uh, I, th I think that European consumers also, also uh, neither don't want to be a victim. Uh, and. Uh, Several last uh, points. Gazprom uh, always blamed that it uh, sells gas at a very high price. This is not the truth. Uh, European consumers pay for gas much more than Gazprom price. There's uh, uh, exact numbers from Eurostat and Eurostat and other statistical data. And here uh, below you can see the table distribution of income between uh, Gazprom, 34%, European Union energy companies, 44%. They do not have gas. They buy gas from Gazprom but they earn more than Gazprom. And of course, European Union member states who tax with gas and uh, receive their own 22%. So uh, then European consumer pays for gas, he pays to European energy companies 44, to his own government 24%, and only 34% uh, to the company who extract the gas and bring it from Siberia to Europe. Is this a fair distribution of income? This is a question. I don't know. Probably this is fair. Uh, uh, why uh, such distribution of income does exist? Because Gazprom cannot find an access to final consumer because he should uh, use mediators, European energy companies. Uh, people from Brussels often say, third energy package is very favorable for Gazprom because it will allow Gazprom to reach final consumer. Uh, in theory, yes. But in practice, even European companies, new European companies, uh, can hardly uh, bypass from a national monopolies like uh, uh, Electricité de France, Gaz de France, etc., etc. You may see European Union statistic. Uh, what is the market share of three biggest uh, companies at national retail market? 99, uh, 100, 75, 100, 100, 100, 100. Is this a liberal market? No, this is oligopolic market. Uh, who are these oligopolic companies? Uh, European uh, countries, energy companies like Total, etc., etc. Uh, will they uh, allow Gazprom to uh, join them? And of course, no. Uh, well, well, well. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we have. Uh, but now we really have uh, an alternative. Either European Union insist to change the rules as it plan uh, to, to change the rules of the game to substitute pr um, the system of long-term contracts and other uh, agreements of. Uh, 40 years history to substitute the system by a key communautaire. Either we should try to find some uh, mutual solutions. Uh, alternative is very simple. Uh, either we stop strategic pa partnership uh, in energy and we start simply uh, to trade 
Uh, what does it mean? That uh, Gazprom does, doesn't care about keep peak capacities in Europe? If there will be a cold winter in Europe, uh, European consumers can go to spot market or can look uh, energy sources somewhere else. This is not Gazprom uh, concern as a supplier who simply trade. Uh, what is another uh, consequence? That Gazprom will not invest enough to meet highest possible demand in Europe. Gazprom will invest to meet the uh, lowest possible forecast of European consumption. Because uh, uh, in this situation, Gazprom will not lose money. Uh, he, uh, Gazprom will be sure that uh, he can sell gas because he uh, oriented itself on the lowest forecast. But in this situation, who will suffer? European consumers. If the lowest forecast uh, will be false, and the real trend of consumption will be um, will increase more. Who will supply uh, additional amount of gas? No, Gazprom. He is not ready. He didn't invest such money. Anybody else? I don't know. But if uh, European Union and Russia would like to continue existing partnership. Uh, an existing long-term energy partnership, we should uh, try to elaborate uh, mutually acceptable uh, rules of the game. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to rush you a bit there, but we have one more speaker. Thank you very much. I think we've got some sparring points there, perhaps. Um, I'm going to, while Marcel is setting this up, let me just just introduce him. This is Mar Marcel Sangsari, who's been doing the organizational work for this conference, and I think he's done a wonderful job with our, our many obstacles we face. So while he's finding Andre Bielli, could we just give him a round of applause for thanking him? And also Natasha Zhukovskaya has been helping out. She's, at the, she's the camera lady back there, and Natasha has has also done a great job with us. And thank you to our volunteer intern, Petra, who's somewhere here. Where is Petra? There she is. Thank you very much to you too, Petra, for helping out. So now we are going to try to connect to Andre Bielli, who is in Tartu, and let me just introduce him. Not quite yet. We aren't quite ready for you. Just one second. I'm just going to introduce you. He's an associate professor at the Center for EU Russian Studies at the University of Tartu. He's been there since August of, of, of 2012. And he, has, he comes from Russia. He did some of his studies at the Higher School of Econ He's worked at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He's also been associated as a visitor with the University of Dundee in the UK. And his research focuses on the EU's external policy. And what I've asked him to um, address today is just a few issues in, re in relation to the Baltic dimension. Because, of course, as you notice from Nikolai's most recent um, chart, well, I'm not, I think it was somewhere there, there's a very high degree dependence of the Baltic states in terms of their oil and gas. In fact, I think it's nearly 100% of imports from Russia, which basically has to do with the old pipeline structure. So. Um, that's, it's a very pivotal point in terms of this relationship. Andre, if you can keep your comments to about, to no more than 20 minutes so that we'll have some time for questions at the end and we'll see how this is gonna work. Are we using Big Blue Button or Skype? A combination, okay, we have a combination technology. So if we can't really see the, I think you're better off showing the power, well, I don't know. Correct. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me a speech. It's actually very interesting to participate at the conference on distance. And um, I was pleased to hear uh, both Amelia and Nikolai. And, uh, I know them both and uh, I'm very happy to hear their expert views. I will present though on the Baltic region. Please change this slide. Can you change the slides? Yes. Yes, no? Yeah, he's changing it. 
Why Baltic region is important? It's important, first of all, because uh, it's the most isolated re region in the European Union. And uh, actually, it's more isolated than, for example, in terms of infrastructure, than, for example, United Kingdom on, uh, or Ireland. Also, it's the smallest European Union markets with very low profitability. And uh, at the same time, the region is uh, politically sensitive towards energy dependency on Russia. And uh, we can observe that there is an increased willingness to pay for a diversification for um, energy supplies from Russia, especially since the crash of 2009. In turn, the Baltic countries are perceived as troublemakers by Russia, basically the countries which lead mostly uh, uh, Russia hostile policies at various uh, European Union levels. So, uh, the Baltic countries, the oil and gas uh, structures in the Baltic countries have been designed in a way to supply energy, not to have a market of energy. So, so you can see on this slide that the pipelines, both oil and gas pipelines, can you change the slide? Thank you. Um, there is a unity flow coming from uh, from Russia to the Baltics, and there is no interconnection between the Baltic states. It actually is a similar situation across whole Eastern Europe, where the markets, especially oil and gas, were designed to either supply the country or to transit oil and gas furthermore, especially the gas. And it provides a certain complexity now for the European markets and especially the gas markets, because this Eastern European markets and in particular Baltic countries are not designed for an interconnected gas market of the European Union. So, let's have a look, please change the slide. Yeah, change the slide. Yes. Um, so, if you can see in the oil markets, there were quite significant um, changes. In fact, actually, that since 1992, Russia reoriented uh, most of its oil export from Druzhba. Okay, you can see on this graph, which I have on the left side of the, of the slide, basically the geography of Transnift's oil shipment in time changes since 1992 to more or less 2000. This graph is a little bit outdated, but it doesn't matter. It still shows certain trend. And the trend is that the oil pipelines are not used for exports or are used less and less. So they used to cut in 1992 and before, up to 60% of oil was exported via oil pipeline of Russia. Now less than 20% is exported this way. Why? Because most of the oil exported during the Soviet times was designed to supply Eastern European countries. Now, most of oil goes to international markets. And you may know that oil gets a commercial value once it's in the tanker, because you can retrain oil in the tanker once it's in the export terminal. Therefore, once Russian companies started to think commercially, 
they started to prefer to sell oil as soon as possible, still when the oil is in the Russian export terminals. And so you can see the figures on the right side of the slide is that what terminals are mostly used. You see that actually the Black Sea Novorossiysk is still the most used uh, terminal, export terminal by the Russian company. At the second place, we see Primorsk, which is the oil terminal on the Baltic Sea of Russia. And then we see Butinga, 7% of oil shipments go through Butinga, which is the Lithuanian territory. So we see that actually Baltic terminals are used less and less in the, uh, in the game. Please change the slide. Change the slide. Uh, so what happens then? There is a diminishing place of the Baltic states in the oil transit, and uh, there is a subsequent closure of first Latvian and then Lithuanian branches of Druzhba pipeline. So that increased the politicization and a perception of threat that Russia one day will also cut out the gas. But here it's an important point to be mentioned that oil and gas are very different. Russia commingles oil in exports, and therefore there is an oral spread which is made and which is slightly cheaper than the international brands of oil. So automatically, oral brands become even more competitive when the oil prices are high. On the contrary, the situation in gas is different. Low prices in the United States and kind of decreasing hub prices in Europe stimulate actually the diversification with the hope that the bulbs can get gas cheaper than the one gas pump. Thanks. slide. Thanks. Uh, here, it's also important to note that Baltic states are most dependent on natural gas from Russia. They are totally isolated from the rest of Europe. And moreover, Gazprom actively participates in the states of each Baltic company. As you can see, in ST gas, it's almost 40%. In Lithuania, it's, it's more than 37%, uh, and it's 25% in Latvia. At the same time, uh, Gazprom operates the underground storage in Latvia. Please change the slide. So, you can see that actually there is a... Please change the slide. Yeah. Uh, there is also a subsequent problem, which has been actually mentioned uh, by both Amelia and Nikolai, of the third energy package, because the center third energy package somehow leads to total separation between supply and uh, transport. And you can see that actually Lithuania and furthermore Estonia opted for a full ownership and bond. Moreover, Lithuania is the only of the three Baltic states which exempted which refused to, to exempt from the uh, third energy package. So basically, Lithuania refused to be under the status of an isolated market, which is extremely political decision and which does not correspond to the economic reality. Estonian situation is different uh, because Estonia is still under derogation from third energy package, but Estonian legislators decided to force the ownership on bank. And therefore, there is an investment commitment violation with Gazprom and moreover with the German EO. With Lithuania now, there is a BIT-based arbitration, which is ongoing. But there are some uh, uh, information or possible agreement on sales of Gazprom stakes in Lithuania by the end of September this year. Interestingly, there is no bilateral investment agreement with Estonia, and 
when Estonia will start to proceed to full ownership and bundling, there is a very important uncertainty which arises. What legal mechanisms will be used to resolve the future dispute? And we don't know, because there is no bilateral investment treaty between Russia and Estonia. And moreover, the energy charge treaty cannot be applicable or might not be applicable since uh, Russia's withdrawal from the provisional application. So the question is still open about the use of the energy charge treaty because uh, Gazprom invested in Estonia before the withdrawal of from of Russia from the provisional application. Uh, but uh, still the question is quite open. Let's say I never heard any uh, clear answer from the lawyers on this regard. Latvia has a different situation. Latvia did not opt for a full ownership abandonment. So Latvian state preferred to create an independent system operator. So it's a second option provided by the directive. But it actually aims to renegotiate the terms of underground storage usage. Uh, next slide, please. The next uh, uh, So, in this context, the Baltic states uh, on, put their expectation on evolving international LNG market. But look at the figures here on this slide. The, Lithuania is the largest Baltic consumer with a little bit more than 3 billion cubic meters per year. Latvia, it's a little bit less than 2 billion cubic meters. Estonia is 0 0.7. Finland, which joins the three Baltic states in, the, in view of creating an LNG, regional LNG market, consumes more than 5 billion cubic meters. So all together, so it make around 10, a little bit more than 10. And that makes an average UK city. So you can imagine that LNG imports to the region would rather increase the price. Moreover, it's quite important to understand that there is a competition with Asia for supplies of LNG. And the demand of LNG in Asia is much bigger, much more constantly rising than in Europe. And Asia, Japan, China, South Korea have a better price for LNG supplies. So it may lead to under usage of liquefied natural gas terminals, especially in the newly built or newly proposed terminals such as those who are proposed in the Baltic states. So the question which is often addressed uh, to the Baltic political elite is why do you really need the LNG terminals? And the answer is we need to have a pressure on Gazprom in order to renegotiate the oil indexed price. Next slide, please. Yeah. So here you can see on the right side of the slide a map of plant diversification projects, which include, and it's quite striking, four LNG terminals, one in Finland, one in Estonia, one in Latvia, and one in Lithuania. But according to several uh, updated information, Latvia rather will not opt for an LNG terminal, but you can imagine that 10 billion cubic meters would be sufficient with one regional LNG terminal. In addition to this, the Baltic countries count on the pipeline interconnector between Poland and Lithuania, which is here in blue, called Amber. But here in Amber, when you look at the project, there is a clear uncertainty regarding third-party access exemption. And if there is no third-party access exemptions, the developers will not build the pipeline. It will be very difficult to attract the finance. And uh, plus, there is unclear link with the capacity markets. And there is no actual uh, agreements with the suppliers. 
Moreover, it's quite interestingly that as uh, the website of Ensoc, it's written that Amber could be used in the reverse flow, meaning that the gas will be flowing from Russia to Europe through this pipeline. It actually doesn't correspond at all to the Lithuania's wish and to the other Baltic countries' wish. And so at the end of the day, what do we see? We see that actually there is a certain uncertainty, especially with economics of the diversification project. Moreover, it has been discussed that there is a trend towards an internationalization of the gas price. And what does it mean? It means that even if the Baltics will get uh, new suppliers and create a hub. This hub will be dependent, the price of the hub will be dependent on external hubs, particularly the TTF in the Netherlands and Northwestern Europe and NBP in Great Britain. Actually, these hubs are much more liquid and imagine a little bit. You are a supplier of LNG located in Qatar. And you are proposed to sell an LNG to the Baltics. What you're going to do? You're going to look at the website, what is the price at the TTF or MVP, because you know you're familiar with these markets. And then you will put a plus to your price for the Baltics, right? So automatically it will be either TTF plus or MVP plus. Next slide, please. So what do we see at the end? Diversification projects rather increase political, rather increase economic risks, and an implementation of the third energy package rather creates a political uncertainty, especially in relations with Gazprom. So this paradoxical situation which emerges, Baltics try to secure their energy supplies, especially gas supplies, but they rather create a situation of insecurity by these diversification projects. But what to do? What, is the, what are the prospects? Actually, the most of the positive developments would be located on the Russia side. If Russia is starting to debate an opening of LNG export monopoly is, or even restructure the export monopoly of Gazprom, then the willingness to pay to the diversification projects will decrease sharply. Moreover, the demonopolization of LNG and development of LNG exports from Russia could provide the Baltics an opportunity to use the LNG terminal not only for import of gas, but also for export gas. So, it changes quite the role of the game. But here it's quite important to say that there is a continuous challenge for the predictable framework, especially for the dispute settlement mechanism, which is not yet organized. And still is not yet in place. It's very hard to imagine that Russia and Gazprom will demonopolize the exports. And especially, the Regional Economic Integration Organization, which was actually uh, and promoted by the European Union to be exempted from the Energy Charter, complicates the Energy Charter process, in especially its acceptance by Russia. So we can say that the depolitization of, uh, of energy dependence of Baltic states on Russia are located in the EU-Russian relations. Next slide, please. So, what are the concerns? For the European Union, we can say clearly, is the Gazprom export monopoly, which is the main concern. And the second concern, which actually derived from the first one, is the price indexation to oil. For the Russian side, it's still the way how the European Union reads the Energy Charter. So it's not about the text of the Energy Charter, it's about how the European Union interprets the Energy Charter. And especially, Russia sees as unfair the fact that European Union 
exempts itself from the energy charter by applying the original economic integration organization clause, but at the same time wants Russia to, to, to apply this treaty. Moreover, the European Union markets are moving towards a number of uncertainties in capacity markets, which bring to the supply capacity mismatch. Next slide, please. So, what are the main elements to go beyond the negative interdependence? Amelia mentioned about the interdependence, but interdependence can be either positive or negative. A positive interdependence is a situation where the actors would like to cooperate between each other, and the negative interdependence is the one where the actors try to escape from each other. So in order to see how the negative interdependence can be removed, and positive interdependence to be created, you have um, to look at the similar situation that European Union should look at the more flexible position on regional economic integration organization and also have a less rigid attitude towards the capacity markets and especially in the energy community treaty countries. For the Russian side, it's important to look to face the market realities because the oil price indexation is certainly outdated and the export monopoly is rather a barrier to Russian energy sector modernization and it's also a barrier to Russia's further expansion to the European Union markets. Thank you very much for your attention and I open for any questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. That, I think, gave us a really nice on-the-ground feel of the complexities of this. Um, I should warn you that some people may have missed some of your commentary because the audio quality came in and out a little bit, but it was very helpful to have the slides so we could pretty well, I think, grasp most of the points. I know personally I missed a few of the points relating to the particularities of the differences between the three Baltic states, but I think we picked up the main points of your argument. We have very little time left for questions, so I'll just um, ask people in the audience if you have a question to state it very briefly, and then we'll ask the appropriate person to respond. But please keep limit your question to one or two sentences. Yeah. Um, Cecilia here. I just wanted to ask uh, two questions directed to two uh, experts, uh, one to Amelia uh, and the other one to uh, Professor Nikolai Koveshnikov. I'll start mis with Mr. Koveshnikov. Um, if we take all this in the Arctic, to the Arctic context, um, we realize that Russia has been proven to have uh, quite vast uh, resources, hydrocarbon resources, uh, which is actually understandable and plausible that they would have as their priority within the 2030 strategy to develop um, the Arctic shelf. So in this context, uh, I think it's also contradictory. Why would they hold Stockman if Stockman holds enough gas to supply Europe for seven years? Um, and at the same time, they want to invest in Arctic shelf development. Why would they stop this one? Is there a financial or a political? Is that a financial or political decision? And then the the question to Dr. Um, uh, had, uh, Amelia is um, has to do with the northern dimension of the EU. Um, how is the EU, and how can the EU utilize this vehicle to boost its energy cooperation with Russia, and therefore to increase its energy security of supply? Over here, this one. Please again keep the question very brief. Hello, thank you for the interesting presentations. My name is Maria, I'm a graduate student at the University of Ottawa, and I'm two weeks away from submitting my master's project on EU-Russia energy relations. And I have uh, two quick questions. First uh, relates to the pipeline situation, and uh, more specifically to Nabucco and South Stream pipelines. And my question is whether we should consider the two projects as clear competitors or more as two complementary projects. And the second question, to what extent does um, energy policy reflect 
um, the identity or self-perception of European Union as a liberal, open, democratic society and perhaps revisionist tendencies in Eastern and Central Europe of Russia, if identity at all plays any sort of role in the energy security relations. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Okay, one last question, yeah, in the back there, Mikhail. Can keep it brief, please. If you could Thank limit you. yourself to one yeah, question. Yeah, I will be very please. brief. So, uh, first two presentations were quite uh, opposite to each other, I mean, in terms of the arguments. So, my point would be how you see the, what would be the points of junction between the European case and the Russian case, uh, in your opinion, because they're quite similar. You Thank mean you. on the energy charter issue yeah. in particular? Okay. Okay, so those are the questions we have. I, very, very quickly, Zoya, yeah. Um, my name is Zoya Gritsenka. I am from Ukraine, and I, I could not <laughs> be silent. I want to ask uh, small questions. We heard very interesting argument about I security, cannot hear this question. supply, I'll, I'll repeat security it. of demand, uh, and I would like to ask what about security uh, of country, transit country? Okay. How European Union, do Europe, does European Union really um, can guarantee security of those countries who transit, okay. and uh, especially Ukraine, because it was mentioned a couple of times that it's unstable yeah. country, and Russia demanded from Ukraine give right. up line to Russia, and uh, how uh, European Union can guarantee security of Ukraine? Okay. The question was, um, the speakers have mentioned security of demand, security of supply, but what about the security of, of transit countries like Ukraine? What can the EU do to secure the situation of a country like Ukraine in the energy sphere? So we have to stop now there. And so I will ask the speakers very briefly to address these. And I'll start with Nikolai, if you would be so kind. You'll have to come up. Oh, that one may work. Let's see if Andre can hear you. Yeah, it works. Oh, can, can you hear? Say a few words. Say one, hello. two, three. One, two, three. Can you hear that, Andre? Did you hear him yeah. say one, two, three? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, no, so, no. We're okay. starting out. We're starting out with Nikolai. I don't think he heard you. Maybe you should. <laughs> Nikolai, can you just come up here? I think it'll be better. Oh. Then we know we can hear you. Okay. Uh, first of all, question about Stockman and Arctic Shelf. Uh, I should remind uh, that Russian energy strategy was adopted in 2009. It uh, does mean that it was written in 2008, before economic crisis, uh, before a drastic uh, decrease uh, of energy demand in Europe. Uh, to develop Arctic Shelf is a long-term strategy to find new resources and to make it in exploitation. Nowadays, there is no demand for new resources, no in Europe, no in the United States. I mean, uh, no demand for gas. So that's why consortium uh, responsible for Stockman Field, uh, that is Gazprom plus several European companies, decided that of, well, no demand, uh, we will not invest. Let's stop, let's frozen the project, let's wait several years. Maybe five, maybe ten. This is a clear answer. Uh, Nabucco and South Stream, are they competitive or complementary? First of all, I want to uh, underline that Nabucco does not exist uh, since the last year then the decision to build a trans adriatic pipeline was made. So no Nabucco, uh, only trans adriatic pipeline, which is 16 uh, BCM per year, uh, among which only 10 BCM will reach Europe. Russian supply to Europe is about 120 BCM, 140 BCM. Uh, and of course, frankly speaking, Nabucco and South Stream were uh, competitive, not complementary, but Nabucco is dead. And not because of Russia, probably because of Turkmen and because of European gas market, where nobody wants to buy cheap, uh, expensive gas from Nabucco. 
uh, energy policy and identity. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, what is the linkage between uh, them? Well, you know, it's very comfortable to Mm, to carry on uh, energy policy correlated with values and identities if it is economically profitable to you. For example, uh, ideology of open market is very good ideology, but then it became non-profitable for the European Union, like in agriculture, well, where is the value of open market and liberal market? No, no such a value. Only agricultural interests, only agricultural lobby. In the case of energy, European Union is a consumer. In this situation, open market is ideologically correct and economically beneficial. Good. Let, let, let's be ideologically correct. Uh, this is... Uh, the way of thinking in Brussels. Uh, another issue, uh, energy policy and values. Uh, well, European Union carry on very uh, value-based uh, foreign policy. This is a good idea. Probably not very efficient policy, but idea is very good. But there are some exemptions. For example, you may uh, take all the set of declaration of Council of Ministers of European Parliament about Turkmenistan. You will never find in these documents any uh, word about human rights and political system in Turkmenistan. Uh, because there are a lot of gas in Turkmenistan and European Union wanted to access this gas. So values are good, but if we want Turkmen gas, let's put values aside. This is not my uh, mm, vision of the situation. This is uh, our Brussels documents. Uh, point of junction uh, between Russia and EU junction. Uh, uh, where did the two views meet? Like, ah, where were two views meet? Oh, uh, depolitization and uh, uh, long term economic assessment of projects. I underline long term because short term uh, analysis can give us very good result in one year and two years, but in five years there will be no investment, there will be no gas, no oil. Uh, I would remind you 10 years investment plans obligatory for uh, European network operators. Uh, uh, how European Union can guarantee uh, security of transit country? First of all, uh, I, sh I should uh, make a cleavage. We were not speaking about security of transit country. We may speak about security of transit. If uh, anyone wants to speak about security of transit country, this is not energy issue. This is political issue, military issue. This is uh, the issue for those who think that Russia wants to invade or to buy Ukraine. I don't think uh, this is real. But security of transit, this is another issue very important. And I suppose the most responsibility for security of transit uh, should rely on the transit country itself. Unfortunately, uh, existing experience shows that uh, there are some problems with security of transit via Ukraine. That's why Russian and European energy companies had to spend billions of dollars to build Nord Stream and to build South Stream. Uh, mm, of course, uh, some talks are going on uh, about the consortium on which would operate Ukrainian gas transit system, but uh, this consultation uh, are very, very uh, slow going on. Mm. European Union does not interested to secure uh, transit. The European Union is interested to secure uh, supply, not regarding the route 
uh, of transportation. Thank you very much. Um, because we're so short of time, and I, we, we have invited the, the guest speakers to lunch, and the lunch venue will close, and our speakers will be left hungry if we don't finish on time. So I have to enforce this. I will ask um, Amelia just to make a very brief comment on the Northern Dimension. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's still an interesting question. Um, God, the Northern Dimension, I, th I thought I would, uh, a bit of a moribund sort of foreign policy. I'm really delighted to have a question on it. Uh, not a hell of a lot, actually, I think, in a sense, <laughs> I guess is the answer. Uh, but it could be, it could be used. Um, as a sort of um, kind of a focal point for a new northern energy neighborhood, if you like. It was launched in, in many ways by the, by the Finnish presidency, um, Marti Yatisari, if I'm not mistaken, um, with an idea, of course, of, of allowing Finland to play something of a, a regional patron, if you like. Um, and it did for a while, but it's sort of fallen off the map. It'd be really good to see it uh, resurrected, if you like, as, as, as a northern complement to the, to the neighborhood policy, which is exclusively a, sort of a, a southern uh, dynamic and, and, and something of a German conceit, if I can put it that way. Um, so seeing Finland and Sweden um, driving forward um, uh, maybe interconnector developments in the Baltics would be good, but I think given that it's, it's, it's the European Union and work in, in, in the northern neighborhood, perhaps connecting with the Arctic Council, for example, and maybe even Canada would, would be ideal. So it, it could be a, a new form of sort of energy governance uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in, in, in that area of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I'm sorry we aren't going to be able to come back to you, I don't think, because we, as I just mentioned, if, I, if we don't, I'm sorry you can't join us for lunch either because you're in Tartu. We would <laughs> happily have you with us for lunch, but if we don't... I tell some words. You can have two two minutes, no more. Secondly, um, I understand the last speaker always has the list. Um, okay, uh, I have a, basically I would like to respond to two elements which were mentioned. First, on energy security and identity. Of course, there is a direct link because if you look at the Norway supply in European Union, there is no problem of identity. You have. Venezuela supplying oil to Cuba, there is no problem of energy security. Why? Because energy security is related to some values. The security perceptions in general are related to the values, right? So automatically, of course, energy security is related to identity. The thing is that identity and security are not permanent. They are durable, but not permanent variables. About South Stream and Nabucco, As, well, Nabucco or, or Transatlantic, they are somehow competing, but in the current European Union legislature environment, especially regarding the TPA exemptions, it's very difficult to basically even uh, construct this pipeline. Look how fast China and Turkmenistan built the pipeline to export Caspian gas to China. It was already built before all the exemptions were negotiated with the, the European Union. And the major issue for any pipeline in the European Union related to transaction costs of the third party access and exemptions to the third party access. Basically, again, capacity markets which are badly designed and not yet developed within the European Union. Finally, security of transit, which is a very important point, again about capacity markets. Ukraine is now a member of the Energy Community Treaty and should normally implement the Energy Community Treaty. And the step towards Energy Community Treaty is actually for Ukraine a step to be away from Russia, because Russia's political project of the Russian Union is to more or lesser extent, non-acceptable to Ukraine. But economic package which is proposed by the European Union, especially with the short-term capacity markets, mandatory third-party access, and unclear future for the transit project uh, contracts, creates a total misunderstanding in Ukraine and quite an understandable opposition towards this project. Therefore, Ukraine is located somehow in between politically unacceptable Russian project and economically unacceptable European Union project. And therefore, maybe this 
the way you could look at the issue of uh, Ukrainian security, both economic and political, in this respect. Okay, thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Andre. That was very helpful. And thank you to all of our speakers um, again. Let me just say before we thank them formally that those speakers, the speakers who are invited to lunch and the students who are working on energy topics who've been invited, we're going to the Baker's Grill, which is in the University Center, so you can begin walking over there. The rest of you, I'm sorry we can't offer you lunch, but we're very happy that you could join us. And so let's thank again all of our participants. <laughs>